Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land I'm speaking to you from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. And just a reminder that we are recording today's event. Now, Six Weeks, Six Issues is our new weekly talk series where we're exploring the big issues we're facing as COVID-19 changes the world around us. We're bringing you the top thinkers and policy experts and decision makers who are directly involved in thinking through Victoria's recovery and they'll answer your questions. Now today we're looking at the future of work and we'll aim to get through as many of your questions as we possibly can. Some of you have already sent in questions and you can also uh, post your questions today. So I'd like to introduce you to our two guest speakers. P Penelope McKay is Associate Secretary of the Victorian Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions. Penelope has years of high level state and federal government experience in economic reform, regulation, budget processes and organisational culture. And Peter Wheeler is partner at PwC and leads their national people and business group. Peter has consulted for some of Australia's largest companies and has vast experience in private sector and govern government business transformation, change management, people strategy and culture change. A warm welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Peter, I might start with you if that's okay. The scale of the changes that we're seeing would have been unimaginable 12 months ago. What are the opportunities and what are the greatest challenges that you're seeing emerging? Yeah, th thanks Kate and, and hi everyone. Uh, yeah, there's no doubt that uh, COVID-19 really has delivered a, a unique workforce experiment and in many ways opened up a Pandora's box, so to speak. And um, I think organisations move very quickly to remote working, um, in many ways surprise themselves. And that includes working remotely, but also new ways of working. And we've seen this rapid shift um, in how we're all working, which would normally have taken probably five to 10 years, but a number of those barriers um, you know, came down very quickly out of necessity. I think the... Um, most organisations are taking this opportunity to take a step back and look at what are the real positives and lessons learnt as a result of COVID-19 and what are those bits that you want to take forward and move forward. So I think um, in terms of some of the real opportunities, um, employees firstly have really seen them. There's been numerous um, benefits that we've all uh, realised. Now that's not just us getting out of bed and walking 20 seconds to you know, the kitchen table um, in your pyjamas to get on a Zoom call. Um, we've all experienced that, but I think it's more of those longer term pieces around workforce flexibility, uh, work-life balance. So the ability to balance a bit more around uh, family and community. Uh, other benefits include less commute time. Um, that, that has driven a lot more space for people to do different things in that time. And of course, a lot of people have found it a lot less distracting working from home. I think the other benefit from an employee uh, experience perspective has been a bit more inclusion. So I think many people have found that being on Zoom calls has actually meant they've had a greater voice than they sometimes have had in the past um, at home. And that might be because there seems to be a little bit less type of um, environments. Um, and for employers as well, I think there's a lot of benefits around productivity. I think we're still to see the longer term piece on that, but certainly through all our surveying, I think it's been started as a higher concern of organisations, but now leaders within organisations are less concerned about productivity and certainly employees are saying the same thing, um, but also uh, just the whole employee experience that, that companies are seeing. I, I think on, on, in terms of barriers, just a few of those very quickly, um, I think a lot of us have experienced the challenge of not of, of losing a bit of connection. Um, it's that ability to have more um, daily touch points that are probably a bit more informal um, and opportunities to collaborate um, in slightly different ways. So technology has worked very well, but I do think there are some of those barriers that we still need to overcome. 
it's really interesting that you you uh, mention uh, productivity, and we might come back to that to what your surveys are, are, are telling us. Penelope, you've made a really interesting point um, that remote work working actually means that those workplaces are agnostic in terms of location. What does that mean, do you think, for a future work workforce? Thanks, Kate, and hello. It's a great pleasure to be here with everyone today. We've certainly in the public service given a lot of thought to what the future of the workplace might look like post-COVID, and there are some exciting opportunities, but it would be remiss of me not to also acknowledge uh, you know, the environment in which we're in, where obviously people are, there's the health crisis, there's a lot of people who've lost their jobs. And I think if we think of the opportunities for remote working going forward, we also need to acknowledge there's some uh, uh, industries where remote working is just not possible and where a physical presence is required. I guess what we're exploring today is those opportunities where we've just traditionally always done things in person and confined ourselves to particular geographic presence and with the current arrangement where everyone's working virtually uh, in certain certain industries we now have an opportunity to rethink what that means so my department is a department that has uh, offices all around Victoria and all around the world and all of a sudden uh, whether or not you're in an office in India or you're in the Melbourne CBD is irrelevant so I'm just as likely now to, to uh, be at a meeting with a colleague uh, in regional Victoria Muldura say as I am with someone who sat next to me in the office so that's been a real eye-opener in terms of how much we previously limited ourselves with using technology uh, and how now our workforce could be based in, in different regions across Victoria and how we can connect with those people more so that's been an opportunity for us to think through uh, how we're impacting regions in a different way and how we can uh, really give a voice to people who are who are living regionally to have much greater say. From a workforce point of view, it also means that when we advertise, we, we can be agnostic as to whether or where someone lives in Victoria, um, as long as they can do the job from a remote office then, or from working from home, then it doesn't matter to us. And that really opens up the workforce and opens up possibilities for regional Victoria as well. So I think there's some exciting opportunities there going forward. Yes, it's a really great, uh, great point. It's, it's interesting though, Peter, isn't it? Because it really has um, meant a, a quite a different relationship between employers and employees and a much more mature relationship. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, um, again, out of necessi necessity, we've tried new ways of working and organisations are being... Um, you know, really open to learning of what's working, what's not. I think, um, you know, the trust is a word that's thrown out a lot. And I think this is the ongoing challenge, but also um, opportunity for organisations. And it's about how do we continue to build trust between the employee and the employer? And that's through uh, protecting their health. So I think that has been one of the positives coming out of COVID. Organisations put their people first. Um, uh, in terms of health, particularly um, when uh, COVID-19 first arose. Um, I think the other piece then is ongoing communication um, and that, that relationship and the communication around what's happening is going to be continually important um, and lead, the, the role a leader plays um, leading remote teams, again, is building that trust as well. Yeah, Penelope, you know, you, you've talked a lot about, as, as Peter just pointed out, you know, the, the, the shift in trust and accountability and the way we sort of measure success in, in, in a workplace, that's really, it has and is, is, is only going to change more, isn't it? Yeah, and I think there's some opportunities for us to think more about what a constructive culture means in the workplace. And I think we'd already come a long way from the days of measuring someone's um, performance in terms of them presentism and just turning up to the office at nine o'clock and leaving at five and we have come a long way from those days but still being relatively unsophisticated in how we measure accountability and how we develop trusting relationships building on a constructive culture in the workforce 
And I think uh, this new environment has given us new opportunities to think about some of those issues. And Peter, you mentioned that sometimes on a virtual meeting that hierarchy, the hierarchies that we're used to in a meeting go. And I think there's lots of other um, prejudices that we've had that are falling away. So the workplace has typically been an environment where we've tended to, uh, people who are extroverts, for example, tend to do better in meetings or they tend to be the ones who get recognised more. Whereas now we're working in a different environment where um, people who are less likely to be dominant in a meeting are now on the same footing as everyone else because we're all just uh, shots on your screen. Um, I know in my previous, in my current role and uh, previously in the departments, I've done a lot of work thinking about people with a disability and how um, we adapt the workplace for people with a disability. And I think, again, this uh, world we're working in where so many of us have whole offices working remotely has really given us new opportunities to think about about that. So for example, I suffer from a hearing impairment. And when I'm in a physical meeting, I offer about 60 or 50 percent of what gets said I can't hear. Whereas now in a virtual workplace where we're all using headphones and we can adjust our own volume, for me that's personally so empowering because now I can hear pretty much 100% of what's said. So um, I recognise that the current environment will disadvantage other people. So people who uh, are more extroverted people who respond more to in present meetings are now disadvantaged. But it's important to recognise that there's a whole cohort that, of our workforce who in the previous arrangement, uh, it's just sort of turned the tables on that. So I think it's a really interesting opportunity for us to think through some of the um, unconscious prejudices we have in the workplace and how we interact with people and how we deal with people. And it's turned all that on our head and given on its head and given us real opportunities to think creatively about what a constructive workforce culture means and what the relationship is between the employer and the employee. And as Peter said, you know, I think given the the current situation that we're in, and particularly, you know, be remiss not to mention the fact that people working remotely are also, if they're parents, having to assist with children who are learning remotely as well, and that's putting extra pressure. And it's just, I think, making that issue of trust with the employer even more important as we provide opportunities for flexibility for parents so that they can keep working where practical, uh, as well as um, being there for their children. So some exciting opportunities as well as challenges in that space, Kate. Some really great points there. I, I had to laugh this morning though because I am a parent um, with a child uh, at home at the moment, but he made the point this morning that he wants to stop being my technical assistant. <laughs> <laughs> so it's you know, a two-way thing. Um, look, I, just a reminder to our audience, you can submit some questions and there are great questions coming through. We'll get to those in a moment. Um, Peter, look, we, we also need to acknowledge, and Penelope, you, po you pointed to it earlier, that this has been devastating for many businesses and the casual workforce. Job creation is going to be central to our recovery. Where do you see the opportunities coming there? Uh, that's a really good question, Kate. And I think um, there are industries where, with, obviously, the impact this has had on different industries is varied. Uh, and so the opportunities are in the uh, industries where previously, uh, just out of habit rather than out of necessity, uh, things were done in person and thinking through what opportunities there might be to do things differently. And I think the opportunities are also in terms of how we think about the workforce. And as I mentioned before, previously we were, uh, when we recruited people, we'd say, we'd specify that they had to be at a certain location at certain times. And if you remove that barrier, the workforce becomes, well, all of Victoria or all of Australia, or all of the world, there's no reason why someone needs to sit, you know, in, uh, in a certain office at a certain time. So it really opens up the workforce to people uh, and that, that does change and pro provide opportunities um, for businesses. Peter, can I ask you, what does a future workplace look like? Will we ever return to a point where we've got thousands of people making the daily commute into crowded, you know, public transport hubs into city office towers? Yeah, look, again, uh, this is one of the, the, the hot topics that we're all thinking about. And it's linked to that first question around what are the benefits and challenges and how do, how do we overcome them? So I think, um, do, do I think we'll continue to um, look at a hybrid model of 
remote working as well as more traditional office space? I think yes. Um, now that might look slightly different. Um, just, to, just to answer the question on, will this be more sustainable? Um, a lot of the surveys we are seeing coming out of organisations would indicate that um, organisations are quite comfortable with this remote working and therefore it will continue. Um, I'll just give you some quick stats for those who like statistics. Um, these are global, but have a big proportion that are Australian as well. But over 50% of CFOs um, in all of our surveys are saying that remote working is here to stay. Here to stay. Over 70% say the flexibility they've created in the workplace will benefit the organisation in the long run. And then eight, over 80% have defined those critical roles that can be performed remotely. So a lot of that work has, has been done. Um, and I guess it touches on this productivity piece. When our surveys were first done a few, few months ago, um, what some of the biggest concerns were about productivity and being able to manage a remote or hybrid workforce. At the moment, only it's reduced right down to 15% of CFOs are worried about productivity and the ability to manage those. So, so I do think it's still one we're looking at. Um, I think the reality is there's going to be a bit of a hybrid. Um, and this is this, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's between the physical and the digital uh, workplace, so to speak. So a proportion of people will continue to work from the home, but two to three days a week, they'll want to come into the office or potentially into a hub. Uh, a lot of the conversations are around regional hubs whereby it's closer to proximity to your play, your home, um, but you don't have to, you get some of the benefits of the workplace. For those who do go back into the workplace, um, we certainly know the physical space is looking different in the short term. Uh, anyone who's been into an office in, in Melbourne uh, is likely to see kitchen areas blocked off, um, the collaboration zones not being used, uh, hot desking not really being hot desks. And so that experience in the workforce is very different. Um, that said, we do know that the physical workplace will probably still have all the advantages that we talked about earlier that are stopping us. Um, and that is the ability to connect with people for certain things being face to face to collaborate um, probably has a better outcome um, and better work setups for some types of roles as well. Uh, but certainly I, I do think it's going to continue to change. It, 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 the stats are, are fascinating and there have been some very amusing social uh, media memes suggesting that this is, does mark the end of, you know, the open plan offices and in particular hot desks. So it'll be interesting to see over the next 12 months, you know, just what those office spaces look like. Um, but Penelope, as I mentioned uh, at the outset, the transformation literally would have been unimaginable so rapidly 12 months ago. Do you think that it's changed the way we think about change management? That's a really good question, Kate. Um, and in terms of the change and its rapidness, uh, it's worth reflecting within the public service in Victoria, we had adopted a principle of, which we called all roles flex, which um, we used to say that all roles would be able to be done flexibly, um, including working from home, unless uh, it could be demonstrated that they couldn't be done flexibly, in which case, you, so it's like a reverse onus of proof. And despite being very committed to that principle, the take up was relatively small. And it was traditionally, you know, women with young children who might work part time, some flexibility around starting hours, maybe working from home a day a week for a very small percentage of the workforce. And I think the experience of those people working flexibly um, in that environment was challenging because if you're the only one on uh, Zoom uh, and everyone else is meeting in, in person, you are very much the second class citizen and you get people on, oh, and then at the end of me, oh, and you know, Penelope, you're at home. Did you have anything you wanted to say? So it became very unattractive. Um, so, uh, so I think the challenge uh, going forward will be when we do have a hybrid model, how do we make it so that uh, meetings are indifferent as to whether you're in the meeting physically or whether you're at home. And I think that when we talk about physical layouts of offices, that will be something that will be built in, as well as thinking what do the new hygiene procedures mean in relation to shared areas in the in the uh, current environment. Um, but that's sort of a long-winded way to come into your question, Kate, which was around change management. And I guess um, 
you know, when we're change, so when we were trying to change ways of thinking about work, uh, and it, we were sort of a pushing it on to people it was a slow take up or a, it was hard to get that revolutionary change. And this has been a revolutionary change that's been brought about by necessity and, and really forced upon people. I think the trick in the change management will be the management when we are able to go back into a physical workplace. And the trick there will be around how do we prevent just snapping back to the way we operated previously and how do we preserve the good things that have come out of this terrible situation with remote and virtual working and how do we adapt our future workforce to preserve those good things. Uh, so I think that's the change management challenge of the future for offices where you are able to work virtually. Yeah, I might just add to it. But, yes. you know, I think that's fabulous. I think um, it's interesting around all roles flex and I think what um, the, the the move to new ways of working for all of us has really helped those who um, those who have been trying to make all roles flex work and set boundaries and uh, um, have really adjusted to this obviously very well. And it's for for those who haven't had to experience that it's put themselves in the shoes of others. And therefore, I think this whole point on inclusion has has really been elevated in a really positive way because we've all experienced it. How do you feel included? Um, you know, the example Penelope said earlier, even around introverts versus extroverts, um, people have just experienced things differently than they have in the past. And, I, and hopefully will um, not just have more empathy, but realize, you know, put yourself in the shoes of other people and, and how do you make those changes? And then just on the, on the change, um, there's no doubt the burning platform was there that, that helped drive it. And, and Penelope, I agree with you. The key for me is how do organisations and leaders and our workforce respond to this new normal so we don't just snap back? Um, and that, I think, will take a conscious effort. We've talked you know, around the benefits and the, the barriers. I think organisations who really take that step back and have a look at it, but design with intent the future, will really be the ones who come out in front. Um, and my last point on, on change will be, we've, I think there's a really opportunity, a real opportunity to do what I'd almost call citizens led change. So this is about, we're all in this together, but genuinely starting a groundswell of people um, in our organization seeing what's worked, what hasn't, but really leaning into that and making it work. Um, so I, I just think this balance between citizen led or our people led is going to be the key moving forward. That's a, that's a really, or both of you have made terrific points. And I think the, the key theme there is that it's so it's easy to return to business as usual. And so it does take conscious effort by leaders to actually identify leaders. And as you say, um, employees and teams to identify what's worked, what are the benefits and how to hold on to that. Um, so that's an interesting one for, uh, for organisations and for employers, Peter, to actually consciously drive. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and again, um, one of the things, one of the key lessons I think we've learned as a result of COVID has been we're all different. There's huge individual differences um, and different preferences. Uh, so that might be everyone from, I might be struggling with remote working because at the moment I'm sitting at the kitchen table with a kid, with my child running around needing homeschool. Um, but it might be um, I'm struggling as a leader uh, with remote working because I'm not using the technology very well and I, I haven't asked for that help. Um, and therefore I don't, I'm not comfortable with how to lead remotely or I don't have the visual um, systems to see performance. So I think the point is that we're all different but how do we look at the differences and the barriers and, and look at ways to overcome them? Yeah, yeah. terrific. And, and if we think about the differences, I think what we're uh, really seeing across organisations is that um, the two uh, cohorts that we really need to think about are firstly young people who don't have the opportunities that usually come when you're a new worker in the workforce to ro get role models and to observe other people's behaviour in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And secondly, people who are living by themselves um, where their social opportunities for social interaction are now very limited. So I think they're two 
cohorts that we think about a lot in that context. The other thing, Kate, just circling back to some of the points that Peter and yourself were making around change management. The other thing that I think is interesting about this situation is there's a whole lot of things that we've done that we really could have done beforehand, but we didn't have the vision and our eyes went open. So for example, I know lots of organisations are now having all staff meetings with hundreds, maybe thousands of people weekly or fortnightly where they're live streaming and through um, platforms enabling all their employees to ask questions. And these, you know, anecdotally, these forums are fantastic. And, and bizarrely, in a crisis for the first time ever, we're getting feedback that communications are a strength. <laughs> Usually when you're going through change management, as you were talking about before, Kate, everyone says, oh, there's not enough communication. We're, we're using the technology to really communicate well with people. And you just, you know, why didn't we do that before? We didn't need to be working from home to have all staff forums with all of our staff on a regular basis. So there's things like that to, you know, really think about how can we be more visionary at work in terms of what we're doing to inspire people to connect with them, to communicate with them, and to make sure we're all aligned to providing the best possible services that we can. So That's really exciting right. opportunities there. Yeah, no, it's a really great point, isn't it? You know, I, th I think if 12 months ago we'd been talking about, you know, an all-staff meeting for 400 people, um, it would have been a technical nightmare that you didn't actually want to, you know, confront. But it's interesting too, because Peter, you made the point earlier that there's a certain level of, uh, of intimacy and uh, connectivity that is gained through, uh, through our, um, our online uh, engagement that, that didn't exist. And that I wouldn't have anticipated either. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I find um, I, I did mention one of the barriers is is that um, the cultural side of those connections I think can be a bit more challenging. But certainly one of the positives is I feel like we can connect as a team a lot quick, more quickly, um, and just being able to see each other on the screen. We've always had these technologies in place and. Um, for, for me, you, you manage to connect with people in, in a very different way. Even being able to see inside of people's homes has yeah. always been this interesting conversation, but it's been one of the highlights. Um, I don't think there's a, a Zoom call that someone forgets to take themselves off mute or a cat walks across the screen or a child. It's just normal. Yeah. And I think that's helped. I think that's really helped with the connection, but I think it also shows the importance, and Penelope made a great point around when we talk about, you know, returning to the workplace more traditionally, how we create a more inclusive way of working is going to be the key. Um, and therefore, the digital collaboration, even if you're in the office, I think will require the same type of approach that we're taking now when we're all remote. So inclusion, um, you know, certainly from a PwC perspective, we talk about return to workplaces and it's as much that we we value wherever you work, whether that's in the office, whether that's at home, whether that's at a client, um, and therefore we need to set up our systems and processes so it, it, it's a workplaces, not workplace. Yeah, no, really great points. But we might go to some of the questions that have come through uh, from our audience. The first is, is the 38 hour week uh, still relevant? How can we move away from the nexus of full-time working and the living wage? Um, and uh, our audience member makes the point that so many of us are stressed and time poor. Peter, I might throw that to you. Yeah, uh, really, really good question. Um, so I, I might start with, I, sus I think, again, this is a global phenomenon. One of the biggest challenges we've still all got is turning off. Um, and so, a lot of people are still finding with the laptop always open, particularly, again, we're talking about knowledge workers and, and people who can work remotely, um, that, that the day does stretch. It starts early and it does stretch. So, so I think that's going to be the challenge moving forward. Another way I'll answer it, though, whilst theoretical, I think is the key moving forward, and that is similar to the all role flex um, policies and intent that we've always had, it's about creating those boundaries. And so um, if, if I want to go and drop my child off or pick them up um, or I want to go and play tennis with someone and therefore that's during the day, then flexibility for me might mean that I don't mind turning back on from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock at night. So I think for me, flexibility is about what make works for us. 
Um, and I think this has more opened up the opportunity that if that's what I choose to do as an organisation or as a leader, I won't be judged as much on that. Hmm. Yeah. Penelope, do you ha have something to add to that? Uh, no, I think Peter's put it really well. I guess for me, the, this has opened up opportunities in terms of flexibility being about what suits the individual. And it's sort of even to that point Peter was making around being able to see people's into people's homes and their personal lives. It's about, I think, giving us opportunities for people to bring their whole selves to work. Uh, and to, we're no longer just hands on a factory line where we are seen for the work we do. We're seen for the people we are and we have workplaces that respect that. And that brings out the best in us as employees as well as the best in us as people. So I think that's the opportunity that presents that we aspire to. There are a couple of questions um, in relation to uh, the casualisation of the workforce. Will work from home and fixed term contracts or the casualisation of the workforce be the future? Will permanent roles disappear? Peter, what, what are your views on that? Mm, that's, a, again, a uh, good question. I, I mean, I, I don't know, clearly. I think there's going to continue to be a balance. Um, and certainly... Um, there's a lot in that question. I think certainly coming into COVID-19, there were a lot more people moving to the gig economy um, and working, contracting part-time. Um, and I think COVID-19 has, has actually identified some of the challenges around, around that in terms of security. So I think the conversation around casualization, gig economy versus fixed, I think one of the positives is that's creating a conversation now and do we need to evolve you know how we work um that all said i suspect organizations will still want to balance the casualization of their workforces um so that they've got a lot more flexibility themselves in terms of being able to bring in talent when you need talent um, um but also um when there's not the work to be done turn it off but i think it's just balance of both and and making sure that we all have the uh work environment that that works for us um, I think, again, some of this comes down to individual preferences. Some people who might have been casuals might, or, or gig economy might want a more permanent, secure role, um, but others may have really enjoyed this experience and therefore think more around part-time working as well. Penelope, a number of questions that are picking up on your um, the point that you made just in relation to opportunities in regional Victoria. Um, and but, but also another question leading out of that is, you know, remote working relies on uh, reliable internet and communications. How do we ensure that these considerations are taken into account? Look, that's a really good question. And in terms of thinking about um, making sure everyone has fair opportunities and equality, I think the issues now are around digital connectivity as well as provision of appropriate, you know, equipment, hard, hardware and software, um, and see that in education as well as in the workforce. So absolutely that is an issue. But I think um, think of the regional issue, for me, one of the one of the big issues that has um, been talked about much in the media over recent years has been the issue of housing affordability. And we know that a lot of employees are spending a lot of time commuting, not necessarily from regional areas, sometimes from out of suburban areas or um, sort of uh, in interface councils between the metro and the regional areas. But a lot of people are spending a lot of time commuting. And I think the opportunity to think differently about that um, is really exciting, as well as the opportunity uh, for regional areas uh, we have um, regional partnerships who meet regularly and give advice to government. And um, while obviously uh, the regions have, are still many um, coming through the, the bushfires of the last summer season and have had impacts from regional tourism and, and you know, like the rest of the other metro part of the Victorian economy and are suffering from uh, the economic as well as the health sort of concerns, um, there are opportunities uh, and they're being recognised to think through what it might mean for regions going further uh, with workforce as well as thinking about, um, you know, opportunities for tourism perhaps from uh, within Victoria. Um, so there are ways um, for us to think differently, I think, in terms of regions uh, and the role that they can play in some of the opportunities as well as challenges that present, but digital, absolutely. And Peter, what about you? Do you think that this will lead to decentralisation? Uh, 
Yeah, look, I, I think uh, in, in many ways it, it could. Um, I think it, it building on what Penelope said, there's when we think about creating jobs, um, regional Australia is continuing to be key. And so I think when we, when, when everyone's taking a step back, which I know um, organisations are, governments are um, all looking at where have jobs been more impacted and what's the future to create those jobs. Um, and that absolutely applies into regional uh, Victoria. And uh, it does open in, in some ways, whilst it's really disruptive of all of us, um, the focus on this right now, now means that where we invest money, um, where do we need to provide more telecommunications or technology capability and bandwidth is be, will be being looked at. Um, but I think it shows it's, it's part of a full system. So it's easy to say, yep, we'll move into regional Victoria. Um, and therefore, what are all the things that need to be lined up to create that? Um, that might be around how do we upskill people um, for those roles in the future? Um, but also how do you think more holistically around a flexible workforce and Penelope touched on this, um, a business in regional Victoria might be able to find the right talent somewhere else as well. So it's going to be a balance of, you know, the ability to remote work means that a workforce could be anywhere with really focusing on how do we stimulate jobs and build the right skills and capabilities and all the infrastructure associated with that. I look, a terrific uh, question, and, and we're being called out by one uh, member of the audience who is saying, who is uh, letting us know that this is very much a, a conversation which is focused on desk and office-based yeah. work, which is yeah. a really good point. Um, Penelope, where might the opportunities be in relation to jobs that are not desk-based? Yeah, I, I'm really glad, thank you to the person who called that out. And I tried to say that at the beginning of my uh, talk as well. I We're talking about um, positive opportunities that exist for uh, office-based workers and don't want to in any way take away from the job losses and the impacts on industries that are not office-based, where what we're talking about is not relevant. Uh, and so I really want to acknowledge that. Um, in terms of uh, opportunities uh, for industries that are not sort of office-based, like Peter and, uh, and my own sort of workplaces, um, I think that it is a more challenging environment. Um, and thinking through, you know, uh, businesses have been adaptable over time at thinking through changed environments, but... Um, they're challenging and there are, um, you know, some businesses are able to seize those opportunities and other by nature of their structure are not so easily able to take to take advantage of those opportunities. So I think the impact, it's really important to acknowledge the impacts of different industry by industry. So just, yeah, absolutely. Peter? Yeah, yeah well, I mean, I, I just echo again what Penelope said, um, you know, recognising that there really has been in many ways a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on different segments, whether that be in, you know, well, geography, um, even gender, but the types of roles. So, you know, when we, when we think around the, the impact on a teacher or a health worker versus a childcare worker or someone in hospitality, there is no doubt people are being impacted in different ways. And, um, you know, even back to your earlier question around casuals and part-times and gig economy versus permanent, um, I think we need to be incredibly sensitive and, and um, acknowledge that it's impacted people differently and therefore society um, has had a big impact and in many ways, we just need to make sure we don't create this divide and, you know, kind of, touches on the digital divide as well um, in terms of the ability to think about what the new uh, new jobs are going to be in the future. Penelope, one um, which uh, it comes off the back of a comment that you made, um, why do you think it took a global pandemic for employers to, albeit indirectly, better cater to disability rights in the workforce? Oh, <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Um, and I think it shows sometimes we haven't been innovative enough in thinking about solutions to problems. Um, so, and I guess it's also worth acknowledging that, you know, to Peter's point, the um, the job impact has been different by industry, but also cohort by cohort. And while I talked about some positive experiences that we've that I've experienced personally, and we've certainly talking to our uh, colleagues who have disabilities, you know, some of the 
uh, things that they've talked about in terms of um, being able to work from home has benefited them. There's also, you know, we know that the dis that people with a disability are more likely to be casual work workers um, and they're more likely to have in insecure jobs and they're the most affected um, by employment opportunities. So, uh, you know, it's important to recognise also they, they're going to be the hardest hit in a situation where job losses are, are a real challenge and un with unemployment. So, um, so uh, I guess you know it's it's is good that we focused on some of the positives that come out of this. I don't I don't know why it's taken a global pandemic. Um, and I just my hope is that in the future we can think much more creatively uh, about some of the um, and recognise some of the irrational um, barriers that we've put up to people working in certain situations. Great, thank you. Um, Peter, maybe one for you. How might remote working impact other things like changes to our city centres and to housing to, to cater uh, to home offices and home businesses? Uh, that is a big question. And I think it's, it's actually a key question that uh, I think organisations are thinking about um, both from a, a, a private perspective and public perspective in terms of big organisations, small and medium, but I also know from a government perspective, it's, it's, it's a key factor. Um, we talk about it will remote working uh, stick, which a lot of this conversation has been about. And in many ways, we're saying uh, significant elements of that will. And therefore that does raise a big question around um, what does that mean to geographies like the CBT and, and Metro Melbourne as well as regions? But then what are all the flow on impacts that we all need to consider? And that's around the infrastructure, around transport, um, around technology. You mentioned, Kate, the technology in terms of the bandwidth if jobs move out. Um, so I think it's one that we need to look at um, very, very carefully. We do know that the CBD has generates a huge part of our economy. Um, and um, I mean, on, on a personal level, it, 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 in many ways, it's heartbreaking walking down the city at the moment because the hustling Melbourne uh, CBD, which like I said, creates a lot of jobs and tourism, but also for small businesses that are, are in the city, um, it, it's having an impact everywhere. So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult one to answer. And it's one that I think we all need to kind of lean into whatever roles we play. Penelope, do you have anything to add on that? Oh, no, I think Peter's covered it really well. Yeah, thank you. There's a great question here, um, which, which is probably a good one to, to end on actually. Um, has this taught us that we're more resilient, resilient than we thought we were? Wow. <laughs> so maybe I'll start. I think uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like we're as resilient, but I, 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 look, I think uh, yes. Um, um, and again, um, we really want to be rec recognised that so many people have been impacted by COVID-19 and we, we've seen the impact on small business and unemployment. Um, but at the, And at the same time, I think it's also in many ways seen some of the best of the attributes of organisations being resilient, adaptive. Um, I think a lot of the stories we all hear around small businesses um, you know, pop-up coffee shops and takeaway delivery all the way through to organisations starting to create hand sanitizer. I don't, I don't want to make it flippant because overall businesses have been really challenged by this, but I think we have seen organisations innovate and respond to it. And then I think um, as people, uh, we, you've had to be resilient to get through this. Um, both those who have been disrupted in their workplaces and jobs but also those that continue to work remotely. Um, I think it's it's meant that we've all had to be resilient and adaptive. And I actually think it's a key quality that we need to instill moving forward. Um, we often talk about skills and you know upskilling for a digital world. I think there's the technical side of that, but there's also the enterprise or what I call the softer skills that some people call. Um, and that's the creativity, the innovation, the resilience. Um, the ability to collaborate, um, I think those things will continue to be more important than ever. 
Penelope, do you, do you, do you think that we will see, you mentioned um, uh, earlier that, you know, we, we often see great creativity and entrepreneurialism come out of a crisis. Um, do you think that, that we're starting to see that? Look, uh, you know, some businesses certainly have uh, and organisations have shown that uh, entrepreneurial uh, drive in this situation uh, with adaptability. And I guess we focused a lot here about um, working from home and the, the challenges and opportunities it presents. Uh, but we've, we've been moving to working from home, which is a big shift at the same time as people have been uh, in the middle of um, the, the current situation, which has meant they haven't had the usual social networks available to them. They haven't been able to go out. Their lives have been disrupted. Um, they've had potentially homeschooling for children um, and and other sort of changes to their lifestyle. So, so people have been, you know, we've talked about some of the positives that have come out for office space working when it's been remote and I guess that that is a testament to the resilience of people that they've been doing that at the same time as there's been so much going on elsewhere in their lives and how they've adapted and and as we said that's just a sub subset of the broader Victorian population and economy in terms of other people who've been affected uh, and showing resilience um, at this time so yeah um, yeah I think it has um, you know people have have brought out the best in people in so many different ways in this challenging environment. Well, look, thank you both so much. Um, it's been terrific to have this conversation. You've been very generous with your time and to our audience as well. Uh, thank you. And thank you for your very thoughtful questions. We have four more talks in this series and bookings are now open on the library's website. So I look forward to seeing you next Friday. But in the meantime, remember that there's plenty for you to explore online and on social through Library in Your Lounge. Enjoy and stay safe.